Okay, thank you. Thanks, Sally, and thanks for inviting me. Um, 10 minutes to come up with all the ideas about solutions for climate change is a bit of a tall order, but I'll, I'll make a start. Okay, thank you. Um, you've just heard from Chloe about carbon emissions. I just want to sort of start with our UK target, which is that we want to reach something called net zero by 2050. And net zero means that we absorb as many carbon dioxide emissions through trees, the natural landscape, and some technologies as we emit. So we've got, we're, we're trying to reduce carbon emissions as much as possible, but also make sure that any that's left over, we can do something with so that we get rid of them in total. Okay, yeah, so. Up yeah, okay, sorry. <laughs> so, um, starting with this diagram of Blackburn's emissions, I want to just talk to you about who or what influences those emissions. Industry is a thing, domestic is a thing, but actually it's all about people and people in their lives, either at home or at work, who are making decisions that have an impact on whether carbon emissions are created or not. So I want to talk about a bit about who is responsible and who can do something about it. You've seen this diagram about where our emissions come from, but there's a great big thing missing from that, which is everything we import into the country. Things that come from other, other countries that we've bought so our clothing and some of our food and our furniture, whatever, our cars, isn't included in this. And a big thing that's not included is our internet and data storage usage. So that has massive carbon dioxide emissions associated with the worldwide web, the internet use, because all that data is stored somewhere in places that are cooled by electricity. So this is a start, reducing this, but we also have to think about all the other things that we do as well. Most of these emissions then are related to things that you do in your everyday life. What you do at home, how you live, what your home is built on, which affects how much energy you need to heat it, uh, whether you drive a car or take the bus or the train or walk, what you buy, what type of food you eat, um, where you have to travel to, where you can decide not to travel. And also, importantly, where you work and what decisions you make at work because this industry isn't just a thing called industry, it's all of us in our working lives. So we have to think about our carbon emissions, not just in our own personal lives, but also in our work lives. A word or a phrase that is touted a lot of the time about what can we do about climate change is behavior change. And behavior change is a bit of a buzzword going, right, everybody's got to change their behavior in order to reduce carbon emissions. Some things we can change directly, but some things are very difficult to do our own, on our own. So we need to think about what this behavior change actually means for us, and whether it is all on us as individuals, and whether us individually can actually reach that net zero target. There are things that are within our own control that we can do something about. So if you think about the energy within your home, <coughs> you can make changes by turning things off, putting a jumper on instead of having the temperature turned up. Um, the, and the energy crisis we're in at the moment is helping people to focus on that. You can think about how much you drive your car. Uh, you can think about whether to walk a short distance. Um, you can also think about what you buy, and whether you really need it whether you want to buy things that last so you don't keep replacing them. There's a big issue about um, eating meat, which meat is a major contributor <coughs> to carbon emissions. So people decide to reduce their meat consumption. Um, so there's a lot of decisions that you can make individually in your family at home that will help you reduce your own carbon emissions. One of the biggest things, though, or the biggest times you want to think about that is when you're making a decision to do something different in your house. If you are redecorating, is that the time to get the insulation done? If you are buying a new car or a second-hand car, is that the time to look for the most efficient one? 
So those sort of decisions are things that we can do and, and decisions we make that have an impact on our personal carbon emissions. And at work, you might have a role uh, where you're in charge of purchasing for something. So what you buy or what you buy on behalf of the company has carbon emissions associated with it. So taking that thought process of what, how my decisions affect carbon emissions into your working role is a really important one as well. But, and this is a huge but, governments that rely on everybody as an individual to take all of those decisions are missing a really big point that we can't do it all on our own. If you are uh, taking your kids to school on the way to work, you've got to pick up your dad to take him to a hospital appointment in the middle of the day and then get home to pick up the kids oh, and get the shopping on the way. You're not going to do that with walking or a five bus journey trip. You are going to use your car. So, so there are decisions that you take that mean you have carbon emissions. If your family lives in Bangladesh, or as mine do in the Middle East, you're not going to never see them again and go, I'm never going to fly. So we, what we need is to have other organisations that take responsibility for helping us to reduce our carbon emissions. And I think two of the really important types of organisations are governments and local authorities. So they can help by putting in place the infrastructure that helps us to reduce our carbon emissions. Jill, is the local authority the same as a council? Yes, council. <coughs> so what's happened in the UK recently <coughs> is we have had a big drop in our carbon emissions. Mainly that's been done through government policy, moving us to a lot of wind power and quite a lot of solar power. And it's, oh God, <laughs> government policy has changed that. Simple things like putting energy labels on equipment. That was a Euro European policy. Putting in place recycling boxes means it is easier for you to recycle. That's a local authority policy. So that helps you to reduce your carbon emissions. <coughs> At a community level, there's also things that we can do. There are communities around the UK that have got together groups of people to take on their own projects and do something. So Plymouth Energy, um, lots of local people have got together and set up Plymouth Energy Community and they're putting solar panels all over all sorts of buildings across Plymouth. The first wind turbine to get planning permission in the last seven years is a community group in Br Bristol. Pretty much onshore wind turbines have been banned for the last seven years, but they got it because they're a community group. Um, there's a, uh, a village in Cambridgeshire called Swaffham Prior. They're putting in their own district heat network because they're entirely reliant on oil and that's really expensive. So communities are getting together and doing things themselves, which is a lot more supportive and easier than trying to do it all yourself. So getting a community organisation together is one important thing. Sure, what's a district heat network? Sorry, a district heat network is where you have a centralised supply of heat, which can be from a renewable heating source, and, and it pipes heat round to your homes instead of everybody having to buy their own oil or gas or whatever. That's one of the solutions that we can, uh, <coughs> can take in, in a lot of areas. But I think the important point I want to make to you is that national and local government has a huge role in making it easier for us to reduce emissions, putting in place infrastructure that helps us. So I'd like to you to start thinking about some of these questions that we should be asking of our leaders. How come London and Manchester can offer a fabulous widespread public transport net network really cheaply and we can't have it here because their leaders have taken control? Why have we not got electric vehicle charging networks across the entire country so it makes it easier for people to own an electric vehicle? Why can cities like Exeter and Cambridge build net zero, zero carbon housing as standard and yet we don't ask our developers to do the same so if you buy a new house now you're still going to have to make it more energy efficient in the future because it isn't. Why are we not asking our local authorities through the planning system to make sure everything they plan from now on 
is zero carbon instead of oh, anything the developers will give us because that's what is happening now. So we have responsibilities and roles in different areas of our lives. There's things we can do ourselves, there's things we can do in the workplace. There's things we can do as communities together. But for me, one of the really important things is, what do we ask of our leaders? How do we demand action from them? How do we make sure that we're voting in people who are actually do, going to do something about climate change? instead of mostly sitting on the fence. We call this in the climate change world, the lost decade. 10 years ago, I was giving these sort of talks and government policy for the last 10 years has pretty much ignored climate change. So we need to get on with it now because we've lost those 10 years. We've got to crack on. Okay, I'm gonna leave you with those questions and ideas to think about what can we do in different roles of our lives. Thank you very much, Jill.